Seven days, seven days, till it's all that I know. Seven days, seven days, and I'll never grow cold. Seven days, seven days, till it's all that I know. Seven days, seven days.
Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we get to open up your word together. Lord, I ask that we would come to you just ready to to be the, the tools that you want to use, the people that you want us to be, the, 
the lives that you want to be an example to this world. And Lord, I, I ask that we would today open up our hearts to let you do that work in us, that we would allow you to, to lead us, to guide us, to change us, to point out the areas that we're wrong and help us to change our minds about them so that we line up our thinking with your thinking, God. I thank you that your ways are perfect, and I thank you that we need you and that you're always there to help us. Have your way in this service and in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies, and welcome to Grace Fellowship Online. And today's the third Sunday, so that means men's fellowship. Yay! And uh, it'll be more yay when we get to it in person, but uh, hopefully that'll be soon. Um, but it's a, it's a Zoom meeting, and so uh, you get a, a link from Bob or Chase and join us for a fellowship. We, we kind of just catch up with each other as everybody's mingling onto the site. And then once everybody's there, we start our Bible study in Revelation. It's a good discussion. So if you're a, a guy, 18 or over, come and join us. We'd love to have you. We'd love to hear what you have to say as well. So uh, with that, let's get out our friend-to-friend -friend cards. And let's pray for our friends that haven't yet come to know Jesus. And pray for ourselves too as we open God's word this morning. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for those that we love that haven't yet come to know you. We ask that you would do whatever it takes to bring them into your kingdom. And Lord, if you'd like to use us, we are available. Just show us what to do and what not to do. And we thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask this morning as we open it up that you would be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Lord, that it wouldn't just be us reading nice words out of the Bible or hearing nice words from me, but Lord, we, we are here to hear from you. So Lord, speak to us. We have ears to hear. We're listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1. We finished up 2 Peter last time. First John 1, we're going to read 1 through 7. It says, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That life was revealed. And we have seen it, and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may, excuse me, so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we're starting a new book this morning. The first letter of John, he wrote three epistles that we have. And uh, in this first letter of John, just like Peter, in his first epistle, John begins by sharing that he's not writing to them about things that he heard from somebody else. He was writing to Christians. 
And it's important to know who he's writing to for context of everything that he says. Um, so it's in, in, in studying any book that you study in the Bible, it's important, especially the New Testament, in studying a book of the New Testament to know who it's written to. And this book was written to the church worldwide. He was writing to Christians. His main concern in writing this letter was to confront a heretical theology called Gnosticism. The Gnostics, interestingly enough, were those who preached that you cannot take Scripture literally, but it's to be taking, taken as allegory, much like one of the major denominations today teaches. Uh, they attempted to combine mysticism, philosophy, intellectualism, and Christianity, much like several heresies which exist today. As Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. So the Gnostics believed that what you know and how enlightened you are was all that mattered. It didn't matter to these people how a person lived as long as they had the same intellectual enlightenment which they had. See, we all know that our faith in Jesus Christ is going to change the way that we live. They didn't believe that. In fact, they preached against that, which is kind of weird. Uh, some people preach against it today. But, but these are the issues that John will confront in this letter to the church because it was filtering into the church and John wanted to get it out of the church. See, John talks about, right here off the bat, he talks about walking in darkness and walking in the light. They're, they're two different things and it directly confronts this Gnostic idea about the way we live doesn't change when we come to know Jesus. And in order to understand this passage about walking in darkness and walking in the light, we need to understand properly the word walking. In this context, the word walking that is used in the Greek is not just a brief action that one would take like walking around the block or walking across the room or walking on the beach, wherever you might walk for a short time. Uh, it denotes the way in which a person walks or lives or what his practices are, his lifestyle. That's what, that's what John's talking about here when he's talking about walking in the light. He's talking about practicing what's in the light. That's, that's what we're aiming for. And he starts out by saying God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, if we're his kids and he's light, shouldn't we be light too? I'll give you the answer. Yes. Um, so if you look at the passage in verse 6, there's an important phrase here. And it says, if we claim to have fellowship with him, to hear John's directly confronting Gnosticism by talking about if we have fellowship with him, the Gnostics believed that it didn't matter how, enlightened, how an enlightened person lived. And Jesus says differently. Because if we claim to have fellowship with him, and yet walk in darkness, we're lying. And we're not practicing the truth. Remember that word practicing as we, as we go on. Um, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says a completely different thing than the, than the Gnostics. And the same thing that John says. Uh, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, they will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? 
Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. See, he's telling them that it's not the people that just say, Lord, Lord. <clears throat> I'll put it this way. It's not the people that know about Jesus. It's not the people that are enlightened with their knowledge. See, not, the word says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. That's what Jesus wants to do in our life. He wants us to represent that love and build us up so that we can actually represent that love and build other people up. Does that make sense? And, and the important thing is, if we love him, the one who says to him, Lord, Lord, will not necessarily enter the kingdom of heaven just because you call him Lord. Only the one who does the will of his Father who's in heaven. And we find out later that the will of his Father is that we bear much fruit in being Jesus' disciples. That we start behaving like Jesus. That we hang out with Jesus and we become more like Jesus. I think we pray that almost every day, don't we? Or don't we pray it every day? In John's Gospel, the 14th chapter, Verses 15 through 21, Jesus says it really plainly. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. He's not talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about, like we talked about Wednesday, if you love me, you'll do what I tell you to do. Doesn't that make sense? And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. And that word counselor is paraclete, which means one called alongside to help. See, he, he's not just going to say, you, you do what I said. He's giving us somebody who is going to walk with us for the rest of our lives and into eternity, who's going to help us do the things that he commands. Those things that he prepared, like we talked about Wednesday, he prepared in advance for us to do. He's sending someone. And he, he tells us who he is. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I'm coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I also will love him and will reveal myself to him. See, the Gnostics were completely wrong. If we're following Jesus, our life should change. Because we follow him. And what is following him? Following him is doing what he tells us to do. If I, if I follow someone and they give me directions, and the directions say turn right after two blocks, if I'm following them, I'm going to do what? That's right, I'm going to turn right after two blocks because I'm following them. If I'm following them and I'm walking behind them and they turn right after two blocks, I'm going to turn right after two blocks because they did, right? I'm going to follow them. I'm going to do the things that they command. Jesus commanded us, follow me. And we're followers of Jesus Christ. The one who has his commands. In other words, you've heard Jesus say things to you. I know you have. And the Lord has convicted you of things when we've been talking before like this. Or in the building. Or in the other building. Or in the building before that. Or here in my living room. Or somewhere else where we had a conversation. The Lord spoke to you. Do what he says. Even if it's hard. He's sending someone called alongside to help that will help you do it even when it's hard. I 
lot of people claim to have fellowship with God and yet walk in darkness. John's addressing that. And he's not saying that a person who sins is not a Christian, as we'll talk about more clearly next week. But a person who chooses the lifestyle of darkness, who claims to be a Christian, is not. See, God turns a light on in our lives one room at a time. It's not like when, you know, we've all had parents come in or grandparents come in and we've been in a deep sleep and they come into the room and they just turn the light on and we're like, <laughs> no, God, God's nice. He kind of turns the light on one room at a time. And he doesn't turn the light on in the whole house like I do. I walk in the house and I have my echo programmed for when I tell her, you know, we're home, that all the lights in the house turn on that, that we need. Not in the rooms that we're not in. Except for a couple. <laughs> I like light. I do. I don't, I'm not one of those and, and won't ever understand people that like all the lights off in their house while they're there. That just doesn't make any sense to me. If you're one of those people, don't get offended with me. I just prefer to have as much light as possible. Except for when I was having really bad migraines. Uh, then that was a little different. But 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 12 says, and Paul speaking, I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of this world or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters. Otherwise, you would have to leave the world. In other words, we're going to run into people who aren't believers and who behave badly, right? You probably run into them at work. You run into them on the street, run into them in the grocery store, gas station. When you're at the gym, they're there. So he's saying, I'm not talking about those people. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister and is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or verbally abusive, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? Don't you judge those who are inside? You can't judge me, man. Well, Paul's saying we need to make a judgment. And that doesn't mean that we're going to act like we're better than these people. But what it does mean is that we're not going to hang out with people that we know to be and that are at large known to be these people who are uh, sexually immoral, greedy, idolaters, verbally abusive, drunkards, or swindlers. He said, don't even have a meal with these people. Don't even invite them to dinner. Well, why? Why? Because when they start espousing that they are a Christian, other Christians are going to look at their lifestyle and stumble because they'll say, hey, these people are having sex with whoever they want to. So I guess it's not, I guess Christians can do that. Hey, these people are ripping people off. I guess I can do that as a Christian. Hey, these people are verbally abusive. These people get drunk all the time. I guess as a Christian, I can do that. No, you can't. Or you shouldn't. I mean, if that's who you were when you first came to Jesus, you're not going to change overnight. But you're not going to practice these things. See, when I first started trying to play the guitar... I was practicing to play the song correctly. But how many of you know when you first start playing an instrument, you make a lot of mistakes, right? Those mistakes were not what I was practicing. And now since we've had the pandemic, I haven't touched my guitar in months, except for that brief two weeks that we were in the church again. And so I'm having to practice all over again, and I'm making mistakes. I'm not practicing the mistakes. See, people who are walking in darkness, they are purposely practicing the mistakes. It's their chosen lifestyle to do it wrong. 
And it's not simply something a person is struggling to overcome. I'm going to live this way. Because by the grace of God, I can do whatever I want to do, and then I can ask forgiveness later, right before I die. Well, you don't know when you're going to die. We've talked about that recently, too. We don't need to choose a lifestyle that is opposite of what Jesus wants us to do. I choose a a lifestyle of righteousness. I choose a lifestyle of following what Jesus wants me to do. Do I get it wrong sometimes? Yes, I do. Do you get it wrong sometimes? Yes, you do. But that's not your lifestyle. You're not known for that. You're not known for your mistakes. See, that's one thing that forgiveness does for us. We shouldn't define a person by the mistakes they've made. If they've asked Jesus to forgive them, we should be able to forgive them as well. I don't want to be known by the mistakes I made. I want to be known as a man who truly desires to follow Jesus and to drag as many others into it as I possibly can. That's who I want to be known as. Not the mistakes that I've made. And I've made plenty of them. I've got got foot and mouth disease. I'm one of those guys that I'll blurt out what what I think exactly, and sometimes it's rude. And I don't mean to be rude. I just, you know, have a foot and mouth disease and need a shoehorn for my mouth sometimes. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 14 through 17, Peter tells us, if you're ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in having that name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome for those who disobey the gospel of God? What will be the outcome for those who disobey the gospel of God or those who don't come to the truth of Jesus Christ? Well, we know what the outcome's going to be. But he says judgment begins with the house of God. See, we can't run around saying, I'm under grace, so I can live however I want. You're being a Gnostic. And that's pretty nasty, if you ask me. So walking in darkness is what Jesus came to take us out of. Remember that slavery we talked about on Wednesday? If you didn't uh, catch Wednesday's teaching, you can go on YouTube and find it. Or you can go on the website and find it, I think. Um, But walking in darkness, that's that's where we came from. And as a Christian, I don't want to go back to what Jesus set me free from. He set me free from darkness. He didn't... He didn't set me free from darkness so that I could just walk right back into it. See, the walking in darkness is the natural lifestyle of the one who does not know Jesus. Well, you're not one who who doesn't know Jesus. You're one who knows Jesus, right? So your lifestyle should be different than that. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. See, notice it's not the one who does not know Christ who walks in darkness that he's referring to. That's their natural behavior. That's why Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where we read a few minutes ago, he says, "Um, I did not mean the immoral people of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Otherwise, you'd have to leave the world. See, I'm not talking about those people who haven't come to Jesus yet. Because that's their natural state. That's their natural way of behaving. And 
In other words, he's saying they, they can't help it. That's, that's who they are right now. They don't have to stay that way. Like we talked about Wednesday, they can be set free too. But it's the one who claims to know Christ and behaves that way. That's criticized in this passage and many other passages in Scripture. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. It's Paul speaking. And he says, Now the works of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. So he just lump anything that I've, anything I've left out that's like that. I, I am warning you about these things, as I warned you before. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Directly opposing the Gnostics. And today, directly opposing those people that say, because of the grace of God, my behavior doesn't have to change. I can just say I'm sorry later. It's not what he's telling us. Because if we practice these things, see the key word here is those who practice such things. Those who choose this as their lifestyle. I'm choosing to not just mess up once or twice, three times or four times. I'm walking back into practicing these things which the Bible calls walking in the dark. I'm not walking in the light that Jesus died to buy for me. I'm walking in the darkness. So those who choose this as a lifestyle will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I can hear people, no, I thought we were under grace. We are under grace. The grace of God should change you because he forgave you. And he gave you the ability to say no to the temptations of the devil. Just like we talked about on Wednesday, you've been set free. Why would you go back to being bound up by the things that are in the darkness? It says in Galatians 5.13, like we read on Wednesday, For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters, only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. In other words, he's saying, don't use your freedom to go out and just do whatever you want to and ask forgiveness later. Don't use this opportunity to go back to what you were in the flesh. The flesh denotes our old lifestyle. There should be a lifestyle change when we follow Jesus Christ. If there's not, there's something wrong. If, if we're evaluating our lives while we're listening to this teaching today and the Holy Spirit is convicting our hearts, maybe we need to check on our relationship with Jesus and see if we're drawing close to him because the only way for the character of God to come through the life of a believer is for us to spend time with him. And allow him to change us. Allow him to remold our thinking. So that we agree with God instead of agreeing with the world. Romans 6 verses 15 through 23 says this. Paul speaking again. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Absolutely not. Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to that one you obey, just like we were talking about Wednesday, either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that 
pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. And having been set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. We became bondservants of righteousness. I'm using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you offered the parts of yourselves as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater lawlessness, so now, what is now? Now that you've come to Jesus, offer them as slaves to righteousness, which is result which results in sanctification or which results in being set apart to be used by God. In other words, we're, we're made for those good works which he planned for us in advance. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. In other words, when, when we were when we were walking in sin, we weren't walking in righteousness. We were free from righteousness, which isn't a good thing. So what fruit was produced then from the things you are now ashamed of? The outcome of those things is death. But now since you have been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit natural byproduct of hanging out with Jesus, which results in sanctification, being set apart for God. And the outcome is eternal life, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, when we turn around and walk in darkness, we're walking in death. And you see, what we earn from sin is death. That's what wages is. Wages is what you earn. I'm not getting what I earned. I'm getting the grace and mercy of God. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Mercy is not receiving what I deserve, but receiving a blessing instead. That's what we get through Jesus but only if we allow him to change our lifestyle. If only we are practicing walking in the light instead of practicing walking in the darkness. I'm practicing walking in the light until I get it right. Are you? I hope so. See, because walking in the light, when we walk in the light, John tells us that we have fellowship with God and with one another. Have you ever just met somebody and there was an immediate closeness between the two of you? You, you didn't know why, but later on you found out, hey, this guy's a believer. Mm -hmm. Have you had that happen? I have. I have on many occasions. Sometimes when I met some of you. But that's, that's the thing. The, the Holy Spirit draws us close to other believers. The natural lifestyle of the believer the light of God is spiritual understanding. Our spirit has been made alive in Christ. We were born with a dead spirit. We were born with a seared conscience. And we couldn't understand the things of the spirit before. But now we can. How many of you say, you know, before I knew Jesus, I would open the Bible and it would just be like I was reading a foreign language. But now you can open up the Bible and the Holy Spirit speaks to you directly. Does that happen to you? Why does that happen? Well, because the one called alongside to help has moved into your life to help you with these things. And your spirit has been made alive and now you are enlightened to the things of God. Galatians 5, 22 through 20, 26 tells us what God is aiming at. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. And fruit is simply the natural byproduct of a plant. The natural byproduct of an orange tree would be oranges, wouldn't it? Natural byproduct of an avocado tree, which I love, would be avocados. 
It would be weird if you walked out to an avocado tree and it started producing fruit and it started producing jalapenos, which I like too, but that's not what I planted that tree for. I planted that tree for avocados, for guacamole. <laughs> um, and Paul tells us that this is what God planted his seed in us for. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what should be coming out of the life of a believer. We don't, we don't struggle. Oh, I've had a strain. You get so love. No. It's the natural, by, what happens naturally from hanging out with Jesus. If we're not producing that, we need to ask ourselves, are we spending enough time with Jesus? Am I spending enough time seeking God? Or have I forgotten to do that? Am I having that time where I'm reading his word? Am I having that time where I'm thinking about his word all day? So that it, it doesn't just get into my head, but it gets into who I am. Am I having that time talking to Jesus? See, prayer is important. Not just giving God our list of demands, but prayer should be a conversation with God where we speak to him and we allow him to speak to us. See, I don't think Christians spend enough time listening during their prayer time. They're just blabbing. They're just giving God their list of demands. God do this, God do that, God do this other thing. God, stop doing that. Is that how your prayer life is? Do you ever ask God for his direction? Do you ever listen to hear what his direction is? See, I think that should be the first prayer that we pray before we pray. I think we should ask God to show us how to pray. The disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us to pray. And he showed them how they should pray. And sometimes, you know, people have taken that prayer and made a formula out of it. I don't think Jesus was giving us a formula. I just think he was showing us, see, prayer isn't really all that complicated. It's a conversation with the Father. And we talk to him and then we, we listen to him. But, you know, God's not going to move, if you will, on prayers that he doesn't agree with. God, kill my boss. I really don't think God's going to do that. I mean, unless it's your, your boss's time, then it's just a coincidence. But God's going to listen to and he's going to say yes to prayers that he, agree with, he agrees with, and largely prayers that will boost us in developing these characteristics that are called the fruit of the Spirit, the natural byproduct of hanging out with Jesus. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He goes on to say, the law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So we've, the old us, the darkness in our life is dead. The darkness in our life has no power. Like we talked about Wednesday, we've been set free. We've been set free to follow Jesus. And he goes on to say in verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So when we become conceited, we think that we know everything. God tries to tell us stuff. God tries to lead us in a certain direction. And we're like, I got it from here, God. You know, I don't, I don't need any help from you. We're in a really sad condition when we think we need no help from God, aren't we? I need help from God every single day because I need to be doing 
what he tells me to do. I need to be humble enough to say, you know what? It's not my way, it's your way. A lot of people, it's my way or the highway. No, it's God's way or the highway. It's following Jesus on the highway. That's what I want to do. James 1, 22 through 25, he says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. A lot of people, oh, that was a great teaching, Don. Well, what are you going to do with it? I don't ever say that to anybody. But the thought arises from time to time. Oh, that was a great teaching. Great, what are you going to do with it? That's why I'm saying it now. If you're thinking, wow, this is a great teaching. What are you going to do with it? See, that's what we're gathering for. You might say, we're not gathering. Yes, you are. We're gathering in front of these electronic devices to hear the Word of God taught. So what are you going to do with it? My friend Kevin Schmidt used to say all the time, when God speaks, it should elicit a response from his people. In other words, when God speaks, we should do something. Is God speaking today? I think he is. So what are we going to do with it? What am I going to do with it is what it boils down to. What are you? Yeah, you. I'm talking to you. What are you going to do with it? We don't need to be hearers only, deceiving ourselves. He goes on to say, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like someone looking at his own face in a mirror for he looks at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of person he was or, or what he looks like is what another translation says and I think that's a better translation. So we look at our face in the mirror in the morning. We look away and we forget why we were looking in the mirror. How many of you have done this? You pick up your cell phone. Because you were going to do something. Something you were listening to or watching or whatever prompted you. Oh, I need to do this. And you pick up your smartphone. And immediately you see, oh, ooh, there's new stuff on Facebook. Ooh, I'm on here. I'm on Facebook. Oh, oh, i got to reply to that. Oh, i got to like, 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 dislike. Ooh, frowny face. Um, wait a second. I picked up my phone to do something. What? I can't, I can't remember why I picked up my phone. See, that's this guy. He can't remember why he looked in the mirror. Well, most of the time in the mornings, we look in the mirror to take care of what we see. You, you get up in the morning, your hair is all... <laughs> some, some people now pay for their hair to look like that. I don't understand it, but they do. Uh, and you do something to fix your hair. Ladies, back up the Mary Kay truck. Beep, 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 beep. If the barn needs paint, paint it. But he says, the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. I'm going to be blessed in what I do. Blessed means, oh, how happy. I'm going to be happy with what I do. If I hear God's word, like we're doing this morning, and I put it into practice, I don't just hear it and say, well, that was a great teaching. I don't want to be like that dumb guy who looks in the mirror and forgets why he's looking in the mirror. See, the Bible should be a spiritual mirror. And when we read it and we see spiritual zits in the, in the book, we don't just leave them there. We do something about it. We put clearasil or whatever people use now on zits. We take care of those. So if they're not there anymore, we don't just walk away from the mirror. We take care of our ugly hair and we make it better. We take care of our dirty teeth and we make them better. We take care of our dirty face and we wash our face. 
and ladies take makeup and they put the makeup on and, and make themselves, you know, look like a princess. Guys, I hope you don't do that. We have words for guys that do that. Anyway, James goes on to say in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm and well fed, but you don't give him what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, if faith does not have works, if it does not have works, it's dead by itself. But some will say, you have faith and I have works. Well, show me your faith without works. And I will show you my faith by works or by what I do. So some people think, they'll read this and they'll say, okay, if I have faith, I'm going to feed the homeless guy. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, claiming that you have faith, but you have no deeds to prove the faith. See, when I have faith, something should prove that I have faith. See, I have faith that this couch is going to hold me up. And I did something to prove my faith. What did I do? I sat and am sitting on this couch. I have faith that this video is going to go out over the internet. And I'm proving that faith by teaching you over this video on the internet. Right? So my, my faith has works to show that I have faith. And he's, he's given us that example of the guy who doesn't have any food to say that saying you have faith but you don't have any works to prove it is like you know, somebody saying I need food and instead of doing something to help them you just say, go in peace and stay warm and well fed. Well, how are they going to do that if you don't do something? How do we prove our faith if we don't do something? I, I find it really cool in the book of Acts. Peter and John went to pray in the temple. And they met this lame guy at the gate beautiful. And the guy was begging. He's the guy that they probably passed every time they went to the temple. And he's begging from them. And they look at him and they say, uh, I don't have any silver or gold, but what I do have, I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The guy had been lame from birth. And what did Peter do? He didn't just say it. He reached down his hand. He took the guy by the hand and he pulled him up. And talking to medical professionals, God did a myriad of miracles in that guy's body because he hadn't walked from birth in order to make him able to walk. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. Why did that happen? Well, because Peter went by and said, in the name of Jesus, uh, be healed. No. I mean, yeah. But Peter did more than that. He did something to prove that he believed what he said. He reached his hand down and he grabbed the guy's hand and he pulled him up. And then the guy went walking and leaping and praising God. He did something. See, we've forgotten to do that. We, we say it, we know it, but we forget to do it. We need to be walking in the light, not just knowing the light. The Gnostics that Paul was, was preaching against, they, they knew the stuff about the light. They just didn't let it change the way they behaved. We need to be different from them. We need to have the behavior of our Savior, which rhymes. 
We need to have the behavior of Jesus. And that's what he's doing with us when we spend time with him. When you spend time with another person for a long time, you spend a whole lot of time with somebody, you're going to start acting like each other. You're going to pick up phrases from each other and all of that. Same thing with hanging out with Jesus. When we hang out with him, we're going to start behaving like him. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and beat. Excuse me. I haven't memorized another version. And pounded that house, yet it did not collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the wind blew and pounded that house and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. The difference between these two people, they both heard the word in both of their lives, the rain fell, the rivers rose, and the wind blew and pounded that house. But one of them's house fell down. The other one's house remained intact. What was the difference? One of them heard the words of Jesus and did something. They didn't just hear nice words. They didn't just hear nice words and go away feeling better about themselves. They heard the words. They allowed the words to become part of who they are. And they acted on them. They did something. Faith without works is dead. Because our faith should put us into action. My faith should cause me to behave in a certain manner. My faith should cause me to do something. Am I making sense to anybody? So let's not be satisfied to simply say that we're believers. Let's actually walk in the light and have fellowship with God and with one another. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you've called us to walk in the light. You pulled us out of darkness and we don't need to go back to the darkness anymore. We don't need to live in the manner that we used to live in. We need to walk in the light because you've turned on the light so that we don't have to trip around falling in the darkness. We can see where we're going and where we are going is following you. We choose the light. We choose to practice walking in the light. Now with everybody's heads bowed and their eyes closed, How many of you would say, you know, I have found myself practicing darkness more than I practice walking in the light. And I want to repent of that because I want to become more like Jesus. I've looked at my life and I don't see the fruit of the Spirit in my life. And when you said, you know, what's wrong with your relationship with Jesus, that convicted my heart. So from this point on, I want to be one who practices walking in righteousness. I'll make mistakes from time to time, but I want to be one who practices righteousness, not one who says, oh, I'm going to do whatever I want. 
and pray for forgiveness later. I don't want to be that guy anymore. If that's you this morning, I would love to pray for you. Would you, wherever you are, slip up your hand and put it back down? I'm not there to see it, but God's there to see it. If you'd like to make this commitment this morning, we're going to pray in a minute. But the first thing I want you to do is I want you to acknowledge it by lifting up your hand. Is there anybody else before we pray? I know the Holy Spirit's talking to some of you. I know that he is. And you can be set free today. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you haven't called us to walk in darkness. And today we come to you because we look at our lives and we don't see the fruit of your spirit. We don't see the natural byproduct of your spirit growing in us. We see the natural byproduct of the flesh. Because Lord, we have been, we've been wrong and we repent of our sin right now. We repent of choosing darkness over the light. And we pray that you would forgive us of our sin. And our sin truly is walking in darkness. And walking in the ways of this world. We choose today to walk in the light that you've turned on in our lives. You set us free. And we choose today, by the grace of God, to walk in that freedom and to produce the fruit of righteousness. Would you do that work in our lives, Jesus? It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Don't forget Men's Fellowship tonight at 6 o'clock. Get the link from Chase or Bob. And I'll see you on Wednesday. God bless you.